and welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Spirits and Monsters of Old Seattle. Uh, we are jumping back in to a new mystery. Uh, when we last left off, our brave investigators were just heading out from the library after an exciting day of spring cleaning, and we're going to be accompanying a coachman named Horatio on his way to Breakwater Hall to speak to Edward Van Duer about his missing, potentially kidnapped son, Tristan. Now, before we get started with the mystery, there is something very important that I want to do, which is give a shout out to the amazing, I think, quintuple threat of cosplayer, musician, DM, and also actress, and also content creator, Ginny D, who created the original adventure that I adapted this from. Uh, it is called The Cold and Hungry Sea. Uh, it isn't available on her web store just yet, but you can find some things about it on her Patreon. And you should definitely still check out her web store because there are a couple other adventures that she's published on there, like Bard Behind Bars and Flesh and Blood. Well, uh, you can... I don't know about the, the content in itself, but she's on point with those titles. Mm -hmm. You should definitely, definitely check them out. Uh, they're at GinnyD.com uh, and also available through her Patreon. Ginny D is my role model. I'm not being facetious, she tells me. <laughs> I mean, she did get to do a cosplay thing with Laura Bailey, so it is hard <laughs> so to beat. So freaking that. cool, I know. Like, yeah. And she also uh, did a collaboration with uh, one of my favorite musicians, Autumn Orange, on a uh, D and D theme song. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. And also got asked to do a cover of the Weeping Dawn for Baldur's Gate Three. So she's, you know, people have heard of her. <laughs> kind of a big deal. <laughs> kind of a big deal. All right, so we are playing an adaptation of an adventure that Ginny wrote. Uh, and this is going to be called The Cold and Hungry Waves. Now, we are going to be catching up with our investigators, as before they can head to Breakwater Hall, they've got some important work to do. They need to do some shopping. So they have enlisted Horatio to quickly take them about Ballard to do some quick bits of light shopping before they can jump into the mystery proper. Uh, again, dear listener, we have spared you a long while of us figuring out shopping. So our investigators are now successfully armed with a new set of lock picks for Kalen and a hurricane lantern for Sophie. Uh, do we want to mention that um, we, we bought the hurricane lantern last time too, but we had to rebuy it because of how uh, Boston handles uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. We only get to carry one item forward for each character. So unfortunately, the Hurricane Lantern didn't make the cut. I mean, obviously last time I kept the gun because of course I did. You know, based on all the people that you shot last mystery. Right, right. So I too kept a gun. <laughs> a shot gun. And uh, I kept the simple bandages. Again, feels like practical choices of a pistol, a shotgun, and a roll of bandages. I mean, yeah, and, and I feel like... Uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, and and with the way that the Vossen rules work, apparently I have duplicated my previous pistol, so hey, it's all good. Yeehaw! <laughs> Julian has acquired a new pistol in the months since the previous adventure. Yeah, don't, don't, don't ask how. It's fine. <clears throat> it's fine. I know a yeah, guy. Don't worry about it. Now, shopping left behind, uh, we find the... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hmm? Yeah? Go going back to uh, Julian's pistol, uh, some uh, uh, patron of his brothel got kicked out and left their pistol behind, so Julian just uh, took that as his own. Are you implying that Julian has a purloined pistol? Yes. Scandalous. <laughs> I mean, not that anything scandalous would ever happen around Julian. I am pure not. as the driven snow. Julian is the soul of propriety. <laughs> yeah, me as the as the as the as the person agrees with Brian. Julian is just nodding solemnly uh, at, <laughs> at what you've had to say there. That's right. That's right. 
All right. We find our investigators seated in the carriage of Edward Van Dur, making its way from the busy Broad Street, uh, where all of the various shops and mercantiles are, uh, and heading slowly towards the west. We slowly pan in to this old, rickety carriage, whose wheels are kind of bouncing and running through the roads. Uh, the carriage is in, well, not the best of shape. Uh, it's still certainly more comfortable than having to walk places, but it's a little bit of a rough ride. The paint is a little bit peeled here and there. Uh, the only areas that have been well kept up are what looks like a family crest of a mermaid holding a bright red apple. Horatio is seated up front uh, with the reins, uh, continuing to uh, drive the carriage towards Breakwater Hall. And we find our three investigators sitting inside. Now, each of them has done something to help prepare themselves for this upcoming mystery. What if they don't yet know that this preparation will be valuable? Uh, Sophie, tell us about your advantage and the cat sitting in your lap. Um, Sophie has a constant companion in Yorts the cat. That's Yorts with a J because he's Norwegian. And um, he is a very fluffy orange cat who looks extremely grumpy, but on the contrary, is the sweetest animal imaginable and also dumber than a box of rocks. Um, but he actually, in general, just provides a lot of inspiration to Sophie. And um, she has uh, taken a bit of inspiration from the captain's braided beard in the last uh mystery and um has been practicing braiding yorts's fur and it's going great it's uh definitely gonna stay like that for you know five whole minutes but um it was a kind of a nice little meditative uh activity for her to to remember um how to braid and and do that with her hands so uh, does he have a little ribbon in the fur, too? He has a little ribbon at the end, and uh, Sophie is sure that he will give her at least five minutes before he reaches around and just bites that right off. He is already starting to reach for it, but he's yeah. a very clumsy cat, so he keeps, like, flopping out of her lap onto the seat. Exactly. Uh, Julian, tell me about your advantage. Uh, yeah, Julian has spent some time... Um, with his father, uh, and they have been singing together. Um, he's playing his fiddle, and they are singing old Filipino folk songs. Uh, he is kind of getting into the rhythm of this uh, kind of like a field song uh, that would be uh, sung uh, by the workers out as they are tending the rice patties. And it's just a good time singing with his father. Excellent. Uh, and Quinn, uh, what is Kalen's advantage for this mystery? Uh, after finding out uh, what this adventure was going to be about, uh, recovering a an heir to uh, some rich guy, uh, Kalen uh, started thinking about it, and he has a bit of a complicated history with the rich, uh, given his vagabond status. So uh, he's he's kind of uh, feeling a, a little bit conflicted about this mission. And so he decides to go to the rich part of town. Uh, where would that be, Brian? Uh, so that would be north of the deadline. Uh, yeah. That is where all of the fancy houses in Seattle are, all of the nice places, all the churches, uh, and none of the more scandalous areas. Cool. Uh, so... Kalen goes there and he starts begging and uh, a few people kind of deride him and, uh, you know, it, plenty of people ignore him. Uh, but there's one uh, especially pompous looking rich guy who uh, stops and gives him a silver dollar. And uh, Kalen takes that as a kind of a sign that, you know, he shouldn't 
judge a book by its cover. And so he's kind of going into this uh, mystery with focus and determination. Wow. Excellent. Nice. Thank you. All right. The carriage, as you are all kind of just thinking, talking a little bit, making some small talk, lurches a little bit as the road cuts to the left. And as it's going along, the carriage then gracefully turns to the right, and you're able to see out of the windows. Slowly, the ocean comes into view, a shining arc from here to the horizon, which is framed by mountains on the far-off Olympic Peninsula. A cool breeze plays through the nearby beach grass and carries the smells of salt and fish. As the carriage draws nearer to the house, you can make out the gates, red and flaking with rust. The walls of the manor are gray and splintering beneath peeling yellow paint, and an old man is limping down the grand front steps, leaning on a cane, clearly eager for your arrival. The carriage draws up to the gate, Horatio hops down and opens it, and then hops back up and pulls forward to this large house. Uh, he hops off one more time and then opens the doors of the carriage, lowering down a small footstool and showing all three of you out and to Breakwater Hall. Thank you for escorting us here, Horatio. Lovely place. Uh, he kind of straightens up his back a little bit as you say that uh, and then puts his cap back on and straightens that. Uh, a few wispy white hairs coming from the edges. Right this way, right this way, toward, uh, towards Master Van Duur. Uh, Edward Van Duur kind of meets you all halfway down this uh, large entryway to the manor. Uh, he is an older gentleman. Uh, his face very, very tightly wrinkled. Uh, his hair has gone stark white and he has a thick white beard. Uh, his eyes look very, very tired. Uh, he's dressed very nicely uh, in what is clearly an expensive suit. However, Julian is able to pick up on a few small signs of wear here and there. The cut of the suit is a little out of date. Uh, the elbows and the knees are just a little bit worn. So this is certainly a nice, but certainly not new suit. Uh, as Edward gets closer to you, you can smell a scent of rich tobacco around him. Um, is it likely that Sophie would have ever run into him before? I mean, she doesn't, you know, she has a little money, but she doesn't really run in aristocratic circles, certainly. But um, would she have ever met him or no? It's somewhat unlikely. Okay. Um, he is the type who tends to keep more to himself. Yeah. Uh, he is definitely old money, although several poor investments you remember from your research have led to him falling on some hard times. Mm hmm Okay. Uh, so he is a former land baron from Germany uh, who is no longer quite as affluent as he once was. So what you're saying is that Sophie does not remember this venerable house. Nope. Okay. Opulent or imperial. Mm -hmm. I've already made that joke in the first episode, so I can't make it again. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I lost my shit. You did. It was great. Uh, he looks over the three of you. Are you the three who are here to help me locate my kidnapped son, Tristan? Indeed, sir. We are uh, the investigators that uh, hope to help you with this problem that you're having. Quite. Matthias sends his regards. I will admit, I don't know of this library organization that you have come from, but I trust Horatio's judgment. He's been a good man. Worked with him for, me for many years. If he says you're up to snuff, I believe I can trust you. Now, um, please, please come inside. Uh, uh, let me see to it that 
we discuss this over a meal. That sounds lovely. And he begins to make his way inside. Uh, he makes a little bit of light small talk, uh, telling you about the Vandur family, uh, having made a small fortune in shipping out in Germany, uh, and having done quite a bit in the way of insuring boats and various caravans traveling places. Uh, he leads you into a dining room. As you all are walking through this manor, it is quite large and it is quite elaborate, but it also feels almost a little hollow. Uh, there's little signs of dust here and there. Uh, there's an echo, echo to the place. There aren't a lot of paintings on the walls and there's a a little bit of a sense of coldness uh, here so close to the sea. Uh, you do spot a few servants who are working around the area. Uh, and Edward leads you into a very large room uh, with a 10 foot long dining table. Uh, it is comedically oversized for the four of you. Please sit down wherever you wish to. Uh, and he goes very almost by rote, to the head of the table. I will take a seat uh, near the head of the table to his right. I'll sit on the other side, on the other side of him, mm -hmm. so on his left hand. Uh, Kaylin will sit at the foot of the table, <laughs> uh, directly <laughs> across from him. As far away from him <laughs> as possible. Away. Um, and Sophie will take out a, a tiny little notebook and a little mm -hmm. pencil that, ready to take notes about what he's going to tell us. Excellent. Uh, after only a minute or two, uh, some food is brought out. Uh, you are served a rich seafood stew uh, and a few uh, loaves of bread. Uh, the bread is a little bit on the stale side, uh, but the seafood stew is quite robust with crabs and fish and potatoes. The well-known uh, component of seafood stew. <laughs> I was going to say, don't say crabs, just say crab. <laughs> uh, as you're beginning to eat, uh, Edward kind of leans forward. About two days ago, Tristan, my son, vanished from Breakwater Hall. Prior to that, he was acting irritable and distracted, uh, spending a great deal of time locked away in his room. He had only just returned here from some fishing trip with some ruffian or another from the town, and suddenly he was gone. In addition to my son vanishing, our family vault was opened and a large sum of money was taken. And does he have access to the vault? He kind of narrows his eyebrows a little. There was no sign of forced entry on the vault, and Tristan does have a key. What is it that you're implying? Oh, I imply nothing, sir. Nothing at all. We just uh, want to make sure that we have the facts wouldn't make any sense for my son to just take the money. He would only need to ask me. Well, he may have been uh, compelled to do so under yeah, threat of he, violence. He may have been coerced, yes. Uh, Edward kind of nods at that. That was what I had wondered. There was no sign of forced entry. Uh, and the family vault could be opened with a key, but perhaps someone made Tristan go in there and take things. I... I need your help to find out what has befallen my son and to get him back. We'll we do our best, sir. We certainly do everything in our power, yes, to, uh, to assist you in this matter. Can I get a vigilance test from everybody? Oh, great. Vigilance, not uh, observation. That's interesting. 
I bust out the hurricane lamp. I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I got one success on five dice. Julian got one success on three dice. Sophie got one. Well, why do I have so many vigilance? One success on eight dice. Vigilance uh, is logic. You had a bonus. You gave yourself a bonus. I didn't give myself anything. I just rolled it. I, you know what? I'm putting the one back. I need it. That's the Put only that back reason. to zero. No cheating. That's the only reason I got a success just then. I'm telling you. That was the extra die. Uh, so, as the three of you are talking to Edward, uh, you are all easily able to spot uh, a couple of the servants are kind of hovering a little. They are Wait, listening. what? Not off the ground. Oh. <laughs> uh, but like flitting around, trying to listen in, uh, and occasionally exchanging glances as he is talking. Okay, I I fully believe now that this guy is attended by a bunch of unseen servants just like flying around. <laughs> Hovering on the ground, not in the air. Well, you also said flitting, which to me sounds like, you know, like a bird flits through the air. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, you'll have to investigate and find out. All right, cool. How lonely the hurricane lamp. Yeah, <laughs> I'm super suspicious of these so-called servants. <laughs> uh, are there any questions that you wanted to ask Edward? Um, was there any sign of, uh, of course, there was no forced entry to the vault. But was there any sign of struggle or violence anywhere in the house? Has the house been examined for such? There was none that I saw. I will speak with some candor. The boy's room is a disaster. It looks as though some vagrant has been living in there for the last several years. <clears throat> So Sophie winces. <laughs> I believe there is quite a bit of rotting food that may be hidden in that room as well, based on the smell. Oh, dear. And did you leave it as it is? I have not yet made any changes to it at Horatio's insistence. Ah, he has good instincts. Yes, good well done. Horatio. Uh, again, he kind of like straightens his shoulders a little bit. And it's just like, Nailed it. <laughs> uh, Master Vandor, if I may ask, you had mentioned that he had just returned from a fishing trip with a uh, ruffian about town. Uh, you don't happen to know the name of said ruffian, do you? Or a description? I am afraid I do not. Um, he picked this one up at... Ah. A local drinking establishment called the Chip Tooth Bar. Chip Tooth Bar? I believe I have had to settle his tab there on several occasions. <laughs> As for the name or description of this ruffian, I'm afraid I do not know. No problem. Um, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, Master Vandor, uh, I think I need to, um, pardon if I may, use the facilities. Uh, and I'm course. going to get up from the table um on my way out i am just mm -hmm. going to try to catch the eye of one of the servants who has been kind of uh hovering and been shooting those meaningful looks and see if i can get them to uh, to kind of mm -hmm. follow me absolutely um as you do give me one moment um you catch the eye of the cook who is bringing you out your meals uh, a fairly plump gentleman uh, who was giving meaningful looks to a couple other staff members. Perfect. And as you walk away, he surreptitiously follows after you. Perfect. Got it. Uh, we will cut to that in just a moment. But before we do, uh, Kaylin and Sophie, anything else that you wanted to talk to Edward about? Yes. Uh, Kaylin says, uh, excuse me, sir. I don't quite understand you don't have a physical description of this person you never saw them i did not i can't keep track of necessarily all the 
characters my son keeps up with. But you described him as a ruffian. Uh, is that... Well, why, why did you call him that if you didn't see how rough he was? I can make some assumptions of the sort of characters one might meet at the chip tooth. Ah, okay. Uh, is there someone who did see him who might have a physical description? Um, or indeed, you know, perhaps a servant caught his name at some point. You may certainly ask them. I'm unsure. Okay. I doubt that some man he went on a fishing trip would try and kidnap him, but it is a reasonable line of questioning. Um, I think then that the next course of action should be to uh, inspect the vault and possibly uh, the young man's rooms, although, of course, you say that uh, they're quite messy, which we understand, but um, there may be some clue there for us, regardless. Uh, his rooms are certainly permissible, but uh, the vault is out of the question. And why is that? I have only just met you. I am not going to let you into what remains of my family's vault. Well, surely you could... We would be happy to go under guard. We just want to see if there's any clues. No, I could not allow such a thing. Okay. Would you at least let us inspect the uh, surroundings of the vault uh, without going inside? Very well. That would be acceptable. Out of character, Kalen's getting in that vault. <laughs> we'll see. I mean, that that is, he has a, that's his side quest for this <laughs> mission. <laughs> And he's got the lockpicks to do it now. Yeah exactly. yeah, exactly. He's like, well, Sophie bought me lockpicks. What am I supposed to do with them? There's a door right there. It's locked. What am I supposed <laughs> to do? Not burgle? <laughs> he's not going to burgle. He's just going to take a look around. <clears throat> he might burgle a little bit. That Yeah, I was going to say. I don't think you could go in a vault and not burgle at least a little. But I feel like Kalen is more interested in chaos versus <laughs> actually stealing something of value. Mm -hmm. Like... He would just be like, oh. He would steal things of delight. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's very true. Uh, so the two of you will be able to head over and take a look at Tristan's rooms and the I'm vault. I'm going to wait until... Um, until Phoenix gets, gets back. back? Yeah, okay. because I don't want to... Uh, like, I want to be able to tell him what we're doing. and. Mm -hmm. Well, and we're still eating, yeah? He excused yep. himself during the meal. Yep, so yep. we'll just finish up and wait for him to get back and finish up. And then the three of us will take off. Perfect. Uh, so, Phoenix, Julian kind of makes his way down a little side passage, uh, and after a couple of moments, a portly, uh, dark-haired man uh, comes kind of slinking around the corner looking for him. Ah, my friend, uh, so glad uh, that you could, uh, you, you, you had the moment to excuse yourself. I just wanted to uh, mention that stew was divine. Is that a family recipe? It is, it is. <laughs> I think you are a person who appreciates some quality. That I am, and truly just a, just a, a work of art in cuisine you have assembled here for us today. Now, I do have to ask, Edward, well, actually, perhaps I will ask, um, how is it working for the man? It seems, uh, seems a bit uptight. Edward is tolerable, but they're Tristan. He's a miserable one to work under. I've heard some stories of him not being, oh, the most responsible of, of, of people. It sounds like it goes beyond that, though. He is a spoiled child who wastes his time and his father's money. He is constantly throwing it away over at the chip tooth. Uh, it's a seedy, disreputable bar and ballad. What is this character's accent? I don't know. Yeah, I, it, I love I wasn't, it. It's I wasn't going to comment on it. <laughs> it is delightful. I like the first you started talking, and my brain went, "Okay, so this is the Earth." <laughs> <laughs> it's an Earth. Like his thumb. 
round. Just a round, you might it's say. an earthling accent. It's good. It's good. Um, the chipped tooth. Um, yes. So is is that where he met this? Did I don't suppose by any chance did you get a? Did you did you know the person that he uh, uh, that he brought home? I don't think he brought him home per se. Uh, he. A little that stop over at Madame of... Lou's. Is that uh, is that what I'm? Is that is that what's going on? Is that is that, is that how it works? I mean, he has spent a fair bit of his father's money there too. Uh, not as much as the chip tooth, since it's so close to mm-hmm. home. Mm-hmm. I see. Well, very nice. Um, I was just uh, really hoping to find out if there was anything you can tell me. If you saw anything, I'd ask the master of the house but i'm 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 pleased to hear that he treats you all well but in my experience those who have come from privilege and have begun to fall on hard times tend to get a bit oh testy if if the if if questions are asked and besides i'm sure the real knowledge of what goes on around here is with those who are actually living it day to day so, is there anything uh, that you saw or, or anything that you heard uh, on the night that he was uh, abducted? Uh, the cook, who introduces himself as Oleg, uh, kind of preens a little bit as you start throwing the compliments out. Uh, you can tell, like, you've got this guy, Julian. <laughs> uh he recounts to you that he was working on making a dinner that evening uh, and Tristan was being just impossible. Uh, He would not come out of his room for love or money. This guy would not do anything to help his father or the the various staff out. Uh, He basically said, leave some food out in front of my door, I'll eat it if I want it. Uh, And they heard a lot of, like, noises coming from his room, of things being, like, thrown around. It almost sounded like he was having a little temper tantrum. Uh, And when uh, they went in in the morning, he was gone. Uh, The room was in shambles, uh, and that was when Edward discovered in the vault... That there was quite a bit of money missing. So is is his room normally uh, in at least a decent order, or is it is it consistently um, the the uh, the wreck that we've 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 heard of? It's not quite as bad. Uh, Nina and Hans and even I go in and clean it up a little bit here and there, especially when he's off in town having a bender. Uh, making sure that it looks at least somewhat presentable. But this was like a tidal wave had come through. Oh my goodness. Well, um, so good of you to keep up the appearances. I'm sure uh, Edward appreciates it. Um, you know, you mentioned well, him... If you, ask, if you ask me, what I think Tristan needs is to finally settle down and get married. <laughs> We've all talked about it. Not Edward, but me and Nina and Hans. That is what that boy needs. Stability and marriage. Mm, Quite. It's uh, certainly being committed in a monogamous relationship is uh, something that's quite uh, important, I can see. Um, I cannot imagine those words falling on more deaf ears. (laughs) Um, is there anybody special that he's been seeing that would lean in this direction with him? Not that I know of. Oh, uh, what a he, shame. Yeah, he is a man about town, as it were. I know the type. <laughs> <laughs> um, just one other uh, question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned he, you know, would not come out of his room, uh, and that he just asked you to simply leave your food at the uh, outside, and he may or may not. Okay, but but before I continue, Oleg, 
the fact that anybody could sample your cooking and just take it or leave it. I mean, that already speaks volumes to lack of character. However, however, leaving that aside for a moment, he didn't want to come out of his room. You've, you've mentioned this as well as, as, as Edward, is this, is this a new development? Is he typically, I mean, he seems the type who is going to be out and about quite a bit. So is this locking himself in his room? Is that an, is that a new development? Oh yeah, that's not the norm. Whenever he's here, as long as he's not nursing a hangover, hmm. he's usually at least spending some time with Edward. Not a dutiful son, mind you, but at least paying lip service to it. Well, there's nothing more important than family. Uh, I have a cousin, uh, Vincent Diesel, uh, who always reminds me of the importance of family. But uh, I thank you for your time, Oleg. No, uh, actually, you know, before I, I head back, I probably should find the. Can you just direct me to the facilities and then I'll make my way back? Oh, of course, of course, right this way. Thank and he you. can show you where those are. Sure. All right, so after a few moments, uh, Julian makes his way back to the table. Uh, Edward was just getting done explaining to Sophie and to Kaylin about the family coat of arms, uh, which he says his great uncle fashioned after the family made its fortune, providing insurance on trading ships. Was this the uh, the mermaid holding the, the red apple? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, any other questions that any of you had for Edward, or did you want to head over to Tristan's rooms? Um, uh, yeah, should we ask him if we uh, can look at the vault? Uh, he may want to, or not the vault, but the surroundings. He may want to go with us, and now may be the best time to do that right after he's done. Yeah. I mean, right after we're done with dinner and we're already together. Yeah, as we're as we're eating, uh, Julian will continue to just lay it on very thick with Oleg mm -hmm. and any additional yep. uh, servants who are coming by and just really, really just, yeah, laying it on thick with their exquisite service um, and helpfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, they are just fawning over Julian. They love this guy. They want to see more of him in this place. Uh, Nina, the maid, is just delighted by you. Uh, Hans, one of the butlers, just is d over the moon anytime Julian is talking to him. <laughs> so this is probably a poor use of one of my items, but I'm going to do it anyway, because <laughs> now I, as a player, love these people. So um, <laughs> as we get up and, and are excusing uh, ourselves to go check out the the vault, um, Julian is going to lag behind just a moment, uh, for just a moment, uh, and try to, uh, you know, uh, get, get the attention of, of Nina and Hans. Uh, mm -hmm. and he is simply going to take out of his violin case of holding, um, and he is going to produce the fine wines and just for yourselves. Oh, we, we couldn't, we couldn't. And somehow yes, I'm insisting. We definitely could. <laughs> And I just give them a, a little wink, blow them a kiss, and make my way to meet the rest of the party. Uh, you have definitely made some friends today, Julian. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you eventually catch up with the rest of the group. We're not too far off. Uh, the Breakwater Hall Manor is definitely a place that feels somewhat unused. A lot of the rooms are shuttered. Uh, the furniture is covered in cloths to prevent decay. Uh, you do see that coat of arms, though, is kind of everywhere. Uh, although it's definitely in a little bit shabby shape outside of that dining hall. Uh, heading down a long hallway and then into a back room, uh, there is a very, very large vault. Uh, we are talking about a heavy-duty metal safe that's probably about seven feet high and probably about five to six feet across. Uh, there is a lock where a keyhole would go, uh, and the whole thing is painted pristine black 
with a little bit of gold paint around the edges, and then across the side, that same mermaid uh, insignia. Uh, Mr. Vendor, uh, let me apologize for uh, misunderstanding the layout of your vault. I was thinking that it was more like a room uh, in, you know, a room in your manor and not uh, a, a separate entity type of vault. So, of course, we wouldn't request to, to see the interior um, of this, uh, this unit here. That's, that's, uh, that would be asking too much. Uh, Edward kind of nods. This particular area does not have the soil needed to support something like a cellar or an underground chamber for a vault. Of course. Uh, Here so close to the tides it would all wash away and start to fill with seawater out this way. I found something like this is much more stable. I had it imported from Germany. Yes, I certainly haven't seen anything like this uh, in our area. It would probably uh, be of great interest. Uh, if anyone was able to, to sell these here, they would probably make quite a lot of money. Craftsmanship is exquisite. Kalen's just, you know, disappointed because he's not going to be able to, to pick the lock because he doesn't speak German. Mm-hmm. It's true. <laughs> It clicks in German when you turn the little gears. <laughs> yeah, and he doesn't know what it's that like, means. Nine, nine, again. nine, nine. You have to turn dust tumblers. <laughs> <laughs> the secret is fan fiction for that. <laughs> or so I've been told. <sighs> I was mostly hoping to get a laugh out of Aaron with that joke. <laughs> uh, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, after you. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, can I... Um, I basically... So he said it wasn't forced, but what kind of a room is this in? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is in what looks like it may once have been something like a bedroom or even a child's nursery, uh, but has since been cleared away just as kind of a makeshift use case for this. Uh, the room's walls are all bare. Uh, there are no visible windows. Uh, but you suspect if you did a deeper investigation, you might be able to find if this room once had windows. Okay, I definitely want to, yes, check the room for any other... Okay, just a clarification point. Mm -hmm. So the, the master got up in the morning and the vault was just open and some stuff was gone? Mm-hmm. So nobody saw anything and nobody was up in order to have caught someone if they did, in fact, come in and purloin things. Correct. Also, whoever it was didn't bother closing it again when they were done. Mm-hmm. Weird. Okay. Um, so really, ingress and egress is not of any interest to us because no one saw, you know, they could have just walked out the front door. So there's no need for sneaky back passages because they just walked in and took it. I turn with a very dramatic flourish and am like nose to nose with, uh, with Edward, unless there are secret entrances. <laughs> what? <laughs> he doesn't even fucking flinch. Are there secret entrances, Master Vondor? No. Okay. <laughs> I kind of brush off his brush off his shoulders a little bit. If there were, <laughs> they wouldn't be secret if I told you. But there are not. Um, I would like to just make, uh, just investigate around mm -hmm. the structure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to see if there's anything dropped on the floor, if there are any interesting nicks on the side of it or yeah. anything. I would like to do the same. Just mm -hmm. see if anything looks out of place or if this is just kind of like a barren clueless wasteland. Uh, feel free to make an investigation uh, test. I will not do that and just continue chatting with Mr. Vondor. Um, the 
lantern could not be used in this situation, or it um, could? The lantern actually could be used in this situation. This is a pretty dark, I shadowy could kind of room. Around to the back and mm -hmm. yeah, and hold it up. The, you, the your items you can use them any time during the mystery, right? Yep. It's not like limited to one. Correct. Okay, then yeah, I will try using the lantern to kind of hold it up closer to the um, the floor and especially around towards the back and everything to make sure I illuminate everything. I believe in you. I believe in you, Sophie. Hell yeah. Hey, two successes on 10 dice. And oh, Kaylin got one success on four dice. And I'm going to clear my dice modificator. <laughs> uh, so you are scoping around. Uh, Kaylin, you kind of check through the place. You look over things. You think maybe with a slightly larcenous mindset. <laughs> oh, yeah, I do. Uh, and to your chagrin, there is no easy way in here. Uh, you think about how you would get into this safe. Maybe that lock could be picked, but it would be hard. And even with the very nice, very new lock picks that you have, you think it would take some doing to get into that. It would probably be easier to blow it up with dynamite. What about my crowbar? Uh, you would bend the crowbar before you open the safe. Damn. Well, I'm out of ideas. Um, so you're, you're sure, like, the only way in and out of this big thing is through that door. Okay. Um, Sophie, you do a little bit of investigating. You use that lantern to kind of peer into some dark corners. You're searching around. Uh, and given that you got those two successes, um, you again, like Kaylin, come to that same conclusion, although you more a little more academically. Uh, <laughs> you are very sure there is no easy way into this safe. There is no like direct path to get into it. Uh, and... You do spot a couple of small indents in the carpet, as though made from a gentleman's shoe, uh, seeming in a quick, but not necessarily frantic kind of movement. Um, she will immediately drop down on the floor and take out her little notebook and start doing measurements. Mm -hmm. Uh, Edward is kind of curiously watching you as you're doing this. Uh, so you have a good sense on the size of that shoe print. Okay. Um, as they are doing their investigation, I am just kind of chatting up um, uh, Edward, but mm -hmm. I do want to kind of lean in, get pretty close and kind of whisper over to him, not in any sort of... Uh, of a menacing way, but definitely making it clear that this is, you know, just between the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just going to let him know. Uh, I, I can certainly understand you wanting to keep things discreet. I just want you to know, Master Van Dor, Arthur, Henry, they've made use of our services. We are trustworthy individuals. And if there is anything you haven't been entirely forthcoming with us. I just want to let you know, we are used to working in this level of society. And my, I assure you of our discretion. And by Henry and Arthur, I am referring to Henry Yesler and Arthur Denny, who he apparently has been rubbing elbows with uh, mm -hmm. previously. Uh, make an observation test, Phoenix. Observation. Okay. Yep, that tracks. Uh, that is zero successes on seven dice. It has begun. Uh, as always, I will offer. Do you want to push that roll? Uh, I don't think it's needed in this case, no. Okay. Um, so a few emotions kind of pass across Edward's face. And then he leans in and whispers in that same kind of slightly conspiratorial tone, if there is anything that I can be doing, to help find my son. I will. I'm glad to hear it. I would not keep information from you if it gets Tristan back to me. I give him a little bit of a squeeze on the shoulder as he has leaned in. I appreciate that. 
or good man. He does not quite seem to know how to parse uh, sort of that physical interaction. You get the sense this is not a guy who is very touchy <laughs> with people. <laughs> well, well neither am I. It's, I mean, I, I can't stand when people uh, infringe on my personal space. As I, I was about to say, but you do me. love infringing on others' personal <laughs> spaces at every opportunity. <laughs> uh, did anyone else pick up on the irony of saying, like, hey, uh, I can be very discreet. You know I can be discreet because here's the names of some people who have come to see me. Like, you were giving away that they went <laughs> to see you uh and using that as, as leverage evidence i love it yeah sorry we... okay all right uh so anything else you want to do here at the vault nah to the boys room no, then. i think we should go. yes all right tristan's room is a mess uh it definitely has a little bit of an aroma uh sort of that delicate funk of a young man who does not wash his things as often as should happen oh, delicate mm -hmm. funk that's cute um the first thing that sophie will do is go to there's probably some shoes out somewhere but if not mm -hmm. she will go to his wardrobe and um, either way, uh, check the measurement of the shoes to see if they match the mm -hmm. one that was near the vault. Uh, and sure enough, Sophie's uh, suspicions are confirmed. That looks like an exact match. So how should we do this? Should we bring up the things we want to look for in particular? Or should we just roll investigation and see what we find out? Uh, so I was going to suggest just rolling investigation unless there's a particular thing you want to search for. So, like, if you wanted to flip the bed, or you wanted to search the wardrobe, or, like Sophie did, check the shoes, uh, that you can just jump into. But you can just make a kind of general investigation check to search the room at large. Uh, so I'm curious about the smell. Uh, does it smell like rotting food in here? There is a little bit of a rank odor of that. Uh, maybe of, like some bread that has gone and turned and maybe some like fruit that's a little bit too ripe yeah uh not quite to like seafood chowder that got left out uh, uh, that's good but there's there's definitely an aroma of like somewhere there is a sandwich in this room and you <laughs> don't know where it is <laughs> but it's here somewhere cool uh um i'm Go ahead. I'll want to keep an eye out in particular for a uh, diary um, or, you know, a place where a diary might be hidden. Uh, mm -hmm. And otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to just roll investigation. Yeah, Julian will join in on this one, but he is making a token effort. Um, he, he doesn't want to dig through this at all. Mm -hmm. I want to look specifically for things that look like they don't belong to Tristan. Okay. Like if that other guy was up here smoking a cigar or mm. something that doesn't, you know, one of these things is not like the others. Mm -hmm. uh, Sophie is absolutely getting the most out of having been reading Sherlock Holmes recently. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Aaron is getting the most after having been marathoning Poirot with my mom. So... <laughs> nice. <laughs> Alright. Uh, can I get an investigation test from you all? Bam! One success on three dice. Yay! You did the, it! It, it! Basically, I found whatever was, like, just next to my foot as I, like, just kind of right? jumped up to the <laughs> side. Stumbled over. <laughs> oh, one success on ten dice. That's okay. Now, were you supposed to have a plus two bonus on that? I used the lantern again. Okay, perfect. Because I figured there might be some dingy, dark corners of this room dingy certainly I really want to go into those dingy <laughs> dark corners braver woman than i <laughs> and kaylin i got one success on four dice nice uh so you all very quickly like the real professional investigators you are go to work on this thing 
Uh, you start kind of going through things. You start looking over stuff. Even Julian participates by kicking over a waste bin. <laughs> uh, however... The most important waste bin in the entire house. You know, the funniest part? That's correct. <laughs> because when you do, Sophie and Kaylin both zero in on a crumpled piece of paper that fell out of that waste bin. And taking a look, it has recently written things by Tristan. Now, I am going to share with you all a handout, but I need one of you to be the one to read it. Who is willing to read awful poetry? Oh, not oh I'm, so on, I'm so on board for this one. Uh, I would be willing to, but I would much prefer to hear Phoenix read it. <laughs> All right, Phoenix, go to town. Uh, <laughs> you find this scrap of paper. I, and it is literally a handout called Crumpled Scrap of Awful Poetry. That's fantastic. Um, Julian looks over it before reading it out loud. And you just kind of hear just a deflating, oh, really? I'm going to have to talk with this boy later. Um, <clears throat> like ripples on the water, so ephemeral is she, and longing like the frigid bite of ice flows on the sea. Beauty cannot be uh, grasped, no matter how you reach, and leaves you breathless, gasping, beached. Beached, Julian? I didn't write it, Sophie. I mean, I I applaud I applaud his efforts. Uh, writing uh, love poetry is a lost art, and you know, if he wants, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. <laughs> Thank the gods he stopped at beached. I hate to see what he would have come up with next. It would have been quite a reach. Mm. <laughs> uh, the three oh, of you. To each. Oh, his own. That doesn't work. <laughs> Hey Brian. Yeah. Is is this another mermaid thing? You're gonna have to find out. Oh no. Uh additionally, the three of you notice one other important detail. Uh as Sophie's checking for shoes, as Kaylin is kind of combing the place looking for diaries and personal items, as Julian is putting in the minimum amount of effort, <laughs> uh you notice all of Tristan's traveling clothes and bags are missing. Uh-huh. Mm. Um, I do have a question, Brian, just to, with the, the handout itself. I'm looking at the image. Um, mm -hmm. The scribbles on the image, mm -hmm. that, that's actually on there, yeah? Yes. Uh, uh -huh. It's like he was writing this terrible poetry and started crossing it out and trying to, like, just draw all over the thing because it was so bad. Got it. You would okay. assume. Got it. At least he's self-aware. In this one instance. Uh, so you think that you have found all there is to find here. Uh, where would you like your investigation to take you next? I mean, it seems like the... Oh, I'll, I'll do this in character. Uh, so you two, uh, it seems like the bar is the obvious next destination, yes? I will leave that to the expertise of my colleagues. Sophie, what say you? Uh, yes, that seems the, oh, by the way, Brian, so I didn't find anything specifically that looked like it was from the other guy? You did not. Okay. Um, yes, that seems the most, uh, logical course of action. Although, perhaps, should we, wait, is, is, uh, is Master Fancy Pants in here with us, or is he somewhere else now? Uh, Edward is kind of a little bit down the hall, letting you do your work. Okay. Uh, you get the sense he um, wouldn't have even followed you uh, this far, except you wanted to go to the vault. Uh, and right. he wanted to keep a close eye on you all during that. Mm -hmm. um, should we mention to Edward about uh, Tristan's baggage being gone? I, it doesn't seem to... You know, I almost asked at dinner uh, if there was any chance that Tristan had just left, but I thought surely that was off the table, uh, you know, that would have been one of the first things that you would check on. But 
seeing as how his bags are gone and his traveling clothes, it seems maybe that could be a possibility. Should we mention that to Edward or should we just let it go for now? I say we just let it go. Uh, it, I'd, I don't see what good that would do and, and it might cause him to, I don't know, freak out or something. I'd be inclined yes, to be. share it with him. I was encouraging him to be open and transparent with us. I'd like to return that courtesy. Well, that's fair. I would like to stop you from returning that courtesy. <laughs> I think um, I will mention it to him uh, before we leave. However, um, I think we should be aware that he may have a negative reaction and be uh, adamant that it doesn't have any bearing. It's possible. I, you know, I may be misjudging him. But... I, I think we simply need to just uh, uh, describe the facts of the matter to him. We don't need to uh, make any conclusions or, or share those conclusions but simply allowing him to know that it looks like uh, bags are missing and clothes have been packed, that need be the extent of it. That's fine. So we will share that with Edward before we, you know, as we come mm -hmm. out of the room, I guess. Uh, Kaylin is going to leave before that happens because he doesn't want to have to <laughs> deal with a rich guy throwing a fit. Uh, as you tell him that, Edward's eyebrows kind of furrow together uh, and it looks like he is struggling to process that information. That simply doesn't make sense. Uh, why? Unless perhaps Tristan was blackmailed. Maybe he was being threatened. And that's why he had to disappear as he's done. You will still get to the bottom of this, won't you? You'll still find my son. It certainly could be a possibility. Uh, and yes, uh, we absolutely will spare no efforts in making sure that Tristan is brought back to his loving father. Kind of nods slowly at that. Uh, and you see his shoulders visibly like relax by half an inch when you say you will spare no efforts. If uh, I can see um, any of the staff, I'll, again, just kind of put my finger up, trying to wave over mm -hmm. to them and basically signal them to uh, to, to bring the master a, a, a stiff drink. Uh, you can definitely kind of arrange that, uh, and they conveniently have some very fine wine on hand. <laughs> <laughs> that was for you! Uh, um, when we get out of earshot like when we get back downstairs and mm -hmm. start leaving or whatever i'll just look at julian and um clearly uh M mr van Dorn uh is convinced and determined to believe that something has befallen his son because he doesn't want to believe any ill of the boy and of course as is a father's privilege but it seems more and more likely that the son has absconded with his family wealth for some reason or other. I would agree with you. Um, I just wanted to make sure I was keeping to my word. And I appreciate you helping me with that. Hearts can be broken, but my word, oh, my dear. Only when it's convenient. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we get along, Sophie. <laughs> of course, darling. And I saw you give the wine to those servants. That was very sweet of you. I mean, I'm sure there's no other places in this, oh, I don't know, shall we call it this this mystery where it would be important to have uh, that as 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 a as a tool. So it's it's much better to just give it to some lovely, lovely people. Well, uh, Sophie like twitches her skirt a little bit, and you can see like this fancy and really too big for a flask but like a really <laughs> scrolled fancy flask that's like stra strapped to her leg and she's like don't worry i've got us covered anyway <laughs> with your sweet for sophie but aaron would never <laughs> and again this is why we get along yeah. sophie all right so the three of you head over to the chip tooth um mm -hmm. before uh, real quick before we do head over there um Chip tooth, is there anything that I know about it as far as the type of clientele that I would expect to find there? Uh, I won't even make you roll for this one. It is going to be on the seedier side. 
Uh, it is not one of the nicer bars in town. In -hmm. fact, I'll tell you about it in my opening narration for it. Ooh. First the Brunswick, now this. You know, I'd really just like to have a nice wine bar one of these days. But (laughs) but fine. fine. Something, you know, classy and perhaps a little bit fancy, but not too fancy. All right. The three of you make your way through Ballard uh, and towards the Chip Tooth Bar. The Chip Tooth certainly isn't the Brunswick. It needn't be, of course. There is room in Ballard for bars, taverns, and pubs of every shape, size, and clientele. From the upscale gambling establishments like the White Front Saloon, owned by Ballard's Mayor Peterson, to small dive bars without proper names, there is a place here for everyone to celebrate life or drown their sorrows. The Chip Tooth falls somewhere on the lower end of that spectrum. Built near the waters of Salmon Bay, past the footpath that would one day become Shillishaw Avenue, the Chip Tooth is slightly narrower than the buildings on either side and has a small drunken lean, like many of the patrons who wander in and out of its doors. It clings to its neighbors to remain standing, and the smells of spilled beer and boiling oysters and shellfish just kind of waft out of it. You hear the merry sound of accordion music, played with enthusiasm, if not skill, echoing from the bar. Uh, what did the three of you do? Um, as you as we approach this bar, mm-hmm. Julian and Kaylin can see like Sophie, like her. It's really subtle, but they know her, and they can just watch that she like turns into a different character. She, like, her shoulders kind of go down, and she, like, you know, kind of, um... A little more swagger to her walk, maybe? Yeah, yeah, she she kind of, like, sways a little bit more when she's walking, and she kind of holds her head up a little bit at, like, an angle, like, coy, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and she sort of does a thing, like, with her clothes. Her clothes don't change. She's still wearing, like this dress and which is not neither fancy nor plain it's just kind of a you know um just a regular dress uh, outfit but um but she does something where she sort of like shakes her clothes out so that they just look a little bit more loose and like um less you know tidy and then she like cocks an eyebrow at julian and walks in the door and i as you cock that eyebrow well, I can tell by the way you use your walk. You're a woman's man. No time to talk. Exactly. Hit it right on the nose, Julian. Let's Feel go. the city breaking. Everybody's shaking. Uh, after they go in, Kaylin kind of looks down at his kind of a little grubby, kind of <laughs> ill-fitting clothes. And it's just like, I'm all set. <laughs> and walks in. Julian looks down at himself and dressed to the nines. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> Julian's just like I hope I don't step in anything in here uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so the inside uh, there is a bar towards the back uh, where there are also a couple of uh, small grills that are going uh, and a few pots of water that are boiling with some clams that are going in them Uh, There's a small entryway that you're in, and there are a few stools in the back and a couple of bar tables. Uh, There are a few dock workers who are gathered around, but it's still, uh, at this point, not quite the busy shift. Uh, We're getting towards evening, but we're not quite at the point where ships will start coming in and where fishermen will be heading in, so it's not too crowded yet. This is a long shot, but... We don't recognize anybody from the Fiscus Ochre, do we? Uh, probably not at this place. Okay. Uh, they uh, are going to go in a slightly more upscale kind of <laughs> bar than this one. Uh, wow, there the is sailors a... go to a more upscale bar than this. That says even more than your other description. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, there is room in Ballard <laughs> for any kind of bar you want to find. 
Uh, there is a woman who is standing behind the counter, polishing glasses. Uh, and there is a gentleman sitting on a bar stool in front of the bar, happily playing accordion. Wait, shit. We didn't ever get a physical description of the guy. No one knew nobody him. Nobody had seen him. Wait, nobody had seen him? No. Mm-hmm. How do they know he was there? That would have been a good question for us to ask. I feel like... <laughs> I'm sure that Brian has an explanation, but I feel like he was just doing the calculus woman face. <laughs> like, how how did they know he was there? Uh, I am willing to let you all in on this one. Uh, Tristan talked about having been out with someone from the Chip Tooth Bar. Oh. Uh, and having just gotten back from a fishing trip with them. Oh, okay. So they knew that he was hanging out, but not necessarily that he had come to the house. Yep. Yeah, oh, and brought right. the guy around. So oh, I cast oh, this guy's self, I, I th- and now I look like Tristan. Tragically, wrong game. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I thought that Tristan had a house guest staying with him. I also kind uh, of misunderstood. I thought that yep. he had, I didn't think he had a house guest, but I thought that he had brought him home at one point, you know, like when they were out carousing or something. Yeah, I think I just misheard when Brian was first describing the situation. Yeah, same. Anyway. All right, so you are in the chip tooth, now armed with correct understandings of things. Well, we know what I have to do here, (laughs) even though I'm terrified as a player to do it again. (laughs) (sighs) But this is what I have to do. I mean, I see the guy with Uh, his his accordion. And... Wait. Oh, Mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Maybe we should do the thing, the whole thing again, but maybe we should go in the, maybe I should talk to the, maybe we should talk to the bartender, ask them, and then I can buy somebody, you know, like we, I can buy somebody around and then you can do the thing. We need to butter them up, Julian. We don't know what's going to (laughs) happen. Well, and and if I can, if I can butter up the entire tavern, that's great. I'm sorry, Quinn, you were saying. Yeah, no, I think that I am good friends with this bartender. Oh! Ah, and Quinn, how are you good friends with this bartender? Uh, with, with my contacts talent. <laughs> or or did you mean Excellent. like... Uh, in in? No, I, I was bringing up the ability right, cool. that you yeah, just picked it. up. Uh, so you, of course, Kaylin, are old friends with Alba. Uh, you have rolled into the chip tooth on occasion. Uh, and Alba has made sure that you not only get a beer for the little bit of money that you have, but you get a little bit of food to help go along with it. Uh, and... Every now and then, you make sure that if you've got a couple extra pennies, you might happen to pop by here. Uh, so the two of you go back a ways. Nice. Uh, and what's her name? Alba. Okay. You already said that, and I forgot immediately. <laughs> I'm, That's all right. I'm done. <laughs> uh, while you are good friends with her, uh, you are at least on speaking terms with her husband, Bors, uh, who is playing the accordion. Ah, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, as we we go in, I'm like, oh, the 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 chip tooth. Oh yeah, I've been here. You two. Uh, yeah, that's Alba and that's Spores. Uh, and she waves from behind the bar at Kaylin. Uh, I, I wave back and start making my way over there. Uh, let me let me talk to her and and kind of uh, lay the groundwork. Uh, so you head on over. Uh Bors is still kind of plunking away at his accordion. Uh, and Alba uh, sets down the glass that she was polishing. Hey, Kaylin, how are you doing? It's been a bit. Hey, Alba. Uh, yeah, haven't had uh, much luck lately. Oh, wait, no, that's not true. Uh, and I pull out this silver dollar from <laughs> my advantage. Uh, I'm not hoping to get any, like... Spend it here, but... Well, no, yeah. no, no. I- I'm not hoping to get any sort of, like advantage out of this mm-hmm. but i i think that would be a fun <laughs> character thing uh she kind of beams at you uh nice yeah 
I, I go ahead and uh, slap that down and, and ask for uh, how how much is a dollar in old timey days? Like a lot, a, a lot. lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Like mm -hmm. like how many beers? Uh, I'm gonna look it up for you because it's gonna be crazy. Uh, <laughs> okay. Do you, do you want to guess how much a dollar would be? Uh, I'm gonna guess. It's hard to say. I'm gonna guess a hundred dollars. Uh, it'd be worth about just shy of three hundred. Shit! Holy crap! Really? Yep, so, and wait, here beer. we are, still making the same minimum wage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, mind you, that is from the first Google result. Uh, the second one literally gives me a different answer on that too. Okay. Uh, which says one dollar is the equivalent of twenty nine ninety one today, whereas the result above it is one hundred dollars is worth. Twenty nine ninety one, which feels like that has more digits than it started with. <laughs> yeah, wait I a just, minute. I don't know. I'm I'm bad at math. I just looked you know over this. to Sophie and I'm just like, why do we keep giving him money? Um, I I think <laughs> I think our friend is cut off for the moment. Oh, I have no <laughs> capital. I can't afford my own lockpicks. The, the guy's got three hundred dollars on him. <laughs> do you have three hundred dollars on you right now? I don't keep that on me. Well, uh, sure. No, of course, of course not. I, anyways. Uh, Kalen will uh, show it to the bartender without showing it to his allies, <laughs> uh, and will uh, slide it over to her and wink and just say, uh, "Just go ahead and put this on my tab for the next time I'm short, would you?" Uh, she laughs because she knows that'll be tomorrow. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and she uh, pours a beer for you, uh, as well as one for each of your friends. Oh, nice. Yeah, and I, I go ahead and introduce them. I'm, uh, yeah, Alba, this is, these are my good friends, uh, Sophie, and uh, I almost said Kaylin. I'm Kaylin. <laughs> uh, Sophie and Julian. Uh, we're just here, uh, uh, to be honest, on a, a little bit of a, a business uh, sort of thing. As I take the beer from her, could I get a mimosa? <laughs> what? What is that? Is Never mind. We got mussels. Do you want mussels? Um, I some, mean, some I'm, I'm already here with mussels. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm fine. She she rolls her eyes, <laughs> uh, and then goes to go dish you up some uh, boiled oysters and mussels. You're getting them whether you want them or not now. Uh, her husband stops playing the accordion and kind of smiles over at the three of you. Uh, I wave him over, like in a. Oh, he, he was just sitting on the uh, bar stool next to the bar, so he's right next to you. Oh, okay. I assumed he was like on some sort of stage. I don't know why. They, there is no stage here. There is. This is not a stage kind of environment. Yeah. How was his playing? I mean, does he? He seem competent, good, enthusiastic, but not good. Uh, that's the one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in fact, I would describe it as enthusiasm without skill. He uh, said that earlier. Yeah, in fact, I think so, he did. Yep. yep. Uh, not very good, but putting a lot of heart into it. If only I knew more about accordions. Uh... <laughs> so out of character, y'all need to start making some subtle inquiries. Otherwise, Kalen's going to start making some unsubtle ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, unsubtle is your specialty. Okay, yeah, yeah, so... Well, I mean, yeah, but the bartender is your friend, so I feel weird, like, leaning in and taking over your conversation with somebody that you already know. Well, Kaylin introduced you to, uh, like, with the idea that you would okay. you so, be welcome in this conversation to say things. So, I mean, I will go ahead and start uh, schmoozing on over to Boris. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe I'll, I'll kind of cast a a look over at Sophie uh, if if she if she wants to to speak with uh, with Alba. Yeah, I could do that. But uh, yeah, I will uh, go on over and uh, and and start schmoozing up to uh, to Boars. And uh, interesting uh, interesting technique there. Where did you where did you pick up your instrument? Queer. I. Oh my God, Brian, I love you. <laughs> I've never had much experience playing in the accordion before, but I knew a fellow who was down on his luck, so I traded him for it. 
and <laughs> just honking away at it. Man who was down on his luck. That, that that sounds a lot like a like a fella. That wouldn't be. That's not. Did you trade oh, that with no. Jan? No, not Jan. Not Who's Jan. a Jan? <laughs> I thought you were talking about Caleb. Sorry. Oh well, I mean, he seems to be on the upswing lately, and I'm just kind of like it, still kind of reeling over the silver dollar. Um, uh, as soon as you say that, Boars laughs and then just says, "Give it a day or two. <laughs> uh, that's fair. That's fair. Oh. Um, well, as you might have heard, um, my friends and I here are actually uh, in your lovely establishment um, on some business um we heard that uh tristan may have been uh in not too long ago uh tristan tristan von door uh have you seen him recently uh he nods kind of thinking about it uh tristan tristan yeah 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 he was in there a couple days ago so i'm not sure if you'd heard but um it seems as he may have gone missing um we heard he might have been meeting uh some fellow or some some person is there anybody he's been spending a lot of time with here well truth be told tristan comes in a lot but he is not exactly the most popular person here i can imagine that seems to be the word he throws a lot of money around like it's going to buy him friends uh but you need work Somebody with a lot of money is nice to know. Uh, he was, I think he hired uh, a, lo- a local guy named uh, Ode Kipper Berg. Uh, Kipper is a nickname, we call him. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm sorry, his name is Ode, Ode Berg. Ode Berg, known as the Kipper. Uh, I think that uh, Tristan helped him, uh, hired him to help him with a fishing trip. Oh, excellent. You know, actually... Um, I don't suppose this Kipper is here today, is he? uh, No, Kipper isn't in here today. You know, actually, now that you're asking about it, Tristan actually asked me if I knew any songs about an old ferry boat that sunk called the Chalice of Yavir. It used to sail over on Lake Washington. The Chalice of what? Yavir. Does that mean something? Uh, you can make a learning test if you'd like. Awesome. So good at those. Yeah, yeah. One success on three dice. So on the three dice, I'm doing all right. It's just when I'm <laughs> you know, rolling on things that I'm actually good at. Right. Cool. So uh, yes, one success. So Julian has to kind of strain his memory for this one for a minute. Uh, but sure enough, so this does... Sophie around. She's good at remembering the things. This actually does kick off a memory for him. He's heard a rumor about this, occasionally kind of drifting through the seedy part of town. Uh, Allegedly, and frankly, Julian would take this with a whole shaker full of salt, not just a grain. (laughs) Uh, But allegedly, the Chalice of Yavir was a ferry boat that Stories claim sunk while a passenger had a chest filled with golden Spanish doubloons <laughs> uh, taken from a sunken pirate, uh, pardon me, a sunken Spanish treasure galleon that allegedly went down outside of the ghost town of Port Angeles and was trying to smuggle them away. Uh, the story goes that maybe the heavy weight of a chest full of gold coins or the vengeful spirits of the Spanish treasure galleon's sailors sank the chalice of Yvier. But it was most likely just an old ship and sank. Okay. So, um, so he was asking, so so Tristan was asking if, if Boars knew any songs about the the fairy? Mm-hmm. And do you? I've heard some rumors, but that is all I know. Uh, and he can relay basically the same information you already knew. Okay. Uh, okay. He thinks it's highly unlikely that any of that is true. Sure, sure. Um, 
Well, thank you. That's been very enlightening. You're very helpful. Um, I don't suppose you know where one might be able to find this kipper. Uh, should one be so inclined? Uh, he and Alba exchange a glance as Sophie was just starting to talk to her. Uh, and he and Alba both lean in a little bit. Kipper isn't in any trouble, is he? I don't believe so. Does he seem the type who would get in trouble? The two exchange a meaningful glance this time. <laughs> uh, they are very reluctant to share where Kipper could be found. Um, it's more, it's less like he's in trouble and more like, why is my accent suddenly going to like Scarlett O'Hara? Um, <laughs> You've got the vape, oh, man, Sophie. I just don't know. This is what happens when Sophie enters a scandalous establishment. Right? <laughs> apparently. <laughs> apparently. She's, yeah, she's taken on, she's probably taken on Madame Myrtle's persona. <laughs> um, it's more like we're looking for information and we think that he might be able to help us it's not um, he, he's unlikely to be in trouble we simply just want to make sure I realize Tristan isn't the most likable of people but we're just trying to make sure he's alright uh, Kalen finishes his beer and belches mm -hmm. uh, which is why he hasn't uh, spoken up sooner uh, but he kind of leans over and says, uh, well, so, Brian, do they know what Kalen does? Uh, they do not know that Kalen works for the library, unless Kalen has openly shared that fact. Oh, I was about to say, I don't know what Kalen does. What does Kalen do? <laughs> <laughs> That's Spend <me>. your money. <laughs> Spends our money. money yes. Spends our money while constantly having more than either of us. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Kalen will lean over and say, oh, uh. I don't know if I mentioned, but I work for the library. Uh, we're we're not in the habit of investigating people, as it were. Uh, I, it's just we think that this uh, Kipper might know something that would be of use to us. They exchange nervous glances again, now for different reasons. Uh, I am going to need somebody to make a manipulation test. However, you can take a plus two bonus from the other characters who are helping. I'll do it. I'm good at these, really. You've got a plus two bonus. All we right. believe in you. Oh boy, here we go. Hey. Okay. Hey. Okay. Hey. Okay. Fucking. Okay. Kind of I manipulated the shit out of these people. Yeah. Uh, so that is three successes on ten dice. Beautiful. That is what I was hoping to see. Me too. So, a first thing, absolutely nailed it. Uh, you are absolutely going to get the information you were looking for here. I am just seeing what extra things you can get for having succeeded so far above and beyond. Let me guess. Boris has a rifle that he doesn't need any longer. <laughs> Probably not that far. <laughs> uh, you know what, Phoenix? Uh, you gain an additional advantage in this mystery. Oh, nice. Ooh. Oh, sick. Uh, you may gain an additional advantage called friends in low or dingy places. <laughs> okay. Is that something, uh, so if I unlock my character sheet, I should add that to the advantages section? Yep, or I could add it in there for you if that's easier. I will let you do it. Perfect. Uh, so at some point during the mystery, you can use that. Uh, to potentially gain an advantage on a roll. Okay. Uh, so they look back and forth between each other and kind of give the nod, like, this is a couple who knows each other, uh, and they can tell you're trustworthy. I mean, look at this face. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Alba looks over the three of you and kind of gives Kaylin a nod, looks to Julian, looks to Sophie. As as long as Kipper's not in any trouble, um, we're just well, we're a little worried about him because he was acting very strangely. Uh, just yesterday, he came in and he was so nervous. He started talking about visiting the witch at the Golden Gardens. Uh, I can give you directions to the shack that he squats on down by the beach. Uh, he doesn't exactly have a home. But 
we do what we can to help take care of him. He's a good lad. Just make sure he's okay. Do everything we can to make sure that he is. Thank you, my dear. Uh, do we yeah. know where the Golden Gardens is? And do we know anything about this witch? Yeah, I know about the witch. You well, sneaky. I- uh, yeah, well, I mean, you know I, about I Golden have... Gardens. Uh, you, Kaylin, and you, Quinn, may not know about any witches or wizards there. Well, I definitely know a wizard there, uh, and I assume his wife is the witch. Seems biased. What? Why? I mean, not every single witch has to be married to a wizard. <laughs> no, but every wizard needs to be married to a witch. Obviously. And I know there's a wizard there, which means there must be a witch there. It is... Uh... What is it? It is common information that every wizard <laughs> with a wizard tower must be in want of a wife who is a witch. I was about I, to say, in want of a witch. Yeah, in want of a witch is what I meant to say. Uh, so the three of you are familiar with Golden Gardens. Uh, it is a recently opened amusement center uh, located north and west of Ballard. Uh, and is, in fact, a state-of-the-art amusement park. Wait, really? Mm-hmm. Oh. It's not mm-hmm. that anymore, is it? Uh, now it's more of a nice beach. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, and for reference, um, the wizard that I know of at Golden Gardens, uh, one time uh, I was living with Brian uh, after I had just moved to Seattle before I got my own place, and we decided to walk to the Golden Gardens Park, but uh, we got kind of lost. And a helpful wizard uh, gave us directions. And that's how we found Golden Gardens Park. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> now, yeah, it, is, it was super cool. It is important to note, helpful wizard in this instance means an old man with a longer beard. Well, <laughs> was a it was that's, a white beard. I will add... Uh, obviously yeah. Gandalf. Like, I don't know where the confusion is. All right. I'm now, so excited. The three of you have some information. Uh, you've now got the address for where Kipper can be found, uh, and you've got some information about a witch located in Golden Gardens. However, you notice a weird look on Boar's and Alba's faces. They're no longer looking at the three of you. Oh, crap. They're looking past you at the other patrons. Uh, oh, are, no. Do they look scared or oh, no? Are they all like frozen? You all turn back around, and the three other dock workers who are in the bar are all just kind of looking into the middle distance. One of the dock workers uh, who's sitting over at the bar ta- uh, one of the little bar tables, uh, looks at the three of you. Do you hear that? I listen. Uh, Kalen's going to plug his ears. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, Julian's kind of listening. Kalen immediately stuck his fingers in his ears. What is Sophie doing? Uh, Sophie is trying to remember uh, what kind of a creature plays music to uh, enthrall people besides the creature at my side, Julian. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would never Aww, call Julian a creature. Thing. Which a creature? Oh, you wouldn't be the first. An adorable creature. Um, well, I mean, that, I also that's how definitely thought she was talking about yours for a second. No, <laughs> yours doesn't play music. Meow, um, meow. Oh God, <laughs> Sammy. Yeah, Sammy thinks he plays music. Um, well, but. But that's how they advertise Julian at uh, his brothel. You know, they say, would you be interested in some creature comforts? (laughs) (sighs) 10 out of 10. (laughs) I don't want to give those points, but I will. (laughs) Uh, So. uh, I want to say it's a neck, but I can't. uh, We are not quite at the spot where you can make that learning test. I know, I know. Uh, But. I will say, keep those suspicions in mind. Um, none of you, especially Kalen, who's got his fingers in his ears, hears any kind of music or song. But suddenly... Look, oh, sorry, mm-hmm. go ahead. 
Oh, I was just going to ask. So you've described Alba and Boar is kind of looking off into the middle distance. Uh, so um, they are not. Alba, oh, and they're Boar, not. Alba and Boar seem to be just reacting normally. The three dock workers who were having drinks here are the ones okay. who suddenly are like staring. Do they all seem to be staring in a like at a point or they're just kind of unfocused in whatever direction they were? It seemed kind of unfocused, way. but okay. over the couple of seconds when you're watching them, suddenly the mood changes. They look angry. Just pissed. Ah, uh, that guy who was at the table gets up and just flings the chair that he was standing at. Oh, shit. And suddenly the three of them come staggering towards you. One of them grabs one of their beer steins in hand and the others just have balled up fists and it looks like they're planning to attack but we'll get to that next session oh, oh man we should have got Kaylin the freaking rapier <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Spirits and Monsters of Old Seattle. Our theme song is Myths and Legends by Robert Bruckmeyer, which is playing right now. Our music is by Andreas Lundström, and you can hear more of his work on the Sweden Rolls podcast. Link in the show notes. Our editor is Hannah Cheney. If you're enjoying this show, please take two minutes to rate and leave a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. I know every podcast says it, but it really does make a difference and helps us continue to grow the show. Finally, remember the motto of the library. Fear gives way to knowledge. Knowledge gives way to wisdom. And wisdom gives way to the truth. Until next time.